investigation. We start talking about Jim Crow. We start talking about apartheid. We start talking about police brutality. These are all symptoms of white supremacy. The more insecure white men become, the more they feel a need to exert their superiority, their power and their force. And so the one obvious victim of white rage has always been black men. White people actually love us. They really do. They, they, they want us here. They love us not in the sense that they respect us or want to treat us fairly, but they love us the way a master loves his dog. And there's a big difference between being a slave and being enslaved, okay? Enslaved is mental. Okay, slave is physical. If you look at black America and you look at black men and put them in two categories, there are those who are popular and then there are those who are great. Racism is the raping of a continent, of, of a humanity of people, of materials and resources, and using them to enrich yourself and validating that for the rest of time. Any black man who, who stands for his people any black man who, who is against the white supremacist structure and, and is willing to stand uh, by any means against any threats is indeed going to be considered a terrorist. Because as long as African people were in charge of the planet, there was harmony. There was no wars between China, Japan, American Indians, the Caribbean. As long as we were in control, there was harmony on the planet Earth. You know, I often say when I lecture that the African that got on that boat is not the African that got off that boat. When you conquer a civilization, you're actually conquering their God. Because what do you do? You change the name of God once you change their religion, once you change their culture. There's a bitterness and an anger towards black people for not allowing themselves to remain in slavery so white people can feel privileged. White supremacy is the only religion that isn't a religion. However, it is the most powerful religion on the planet. At the Getty Museum out here in Los Angeles, there is a, a painting, an illustration from the 1400s, Moses defeating the Moors. And in the illustration, you see African people who are the Moors in Europe ruling. They're in a castle and they're battling white Europeans. And the reason why they named the painting Moses Defeating the Moors is because the Europeans at the time, when they were going through the Inquisition, when they were going through the Reconquista, when they were getting the Africans called the Moors out of Europe, they had a religious undertone. And what they would do, they would draw stories from the Bible and tie that into their current struggle. And that's one of the things that gave them so much momentum. There was a religious undertone to it. The Africans in Europe originally came out of the Moors, came out of North Africa, out of the area that's known as Morocco. Ruled that area called the Iberian Peninsula for centuries. And it's interesting because what most people don't realize is that the Moors had brought to Western Europe before Europe even had developed uh, the technologies to do a lot of the things that they had done. And when the Moors had been defeated in 1492, that expulsion of the Moors, they, they had moved into areas that were now considered Western Europe. But they brought with them a lot of the technology, the science, the astronomy, irrigation for being able to, to, uh, to develop these lands. And that got erased out of history altogether. And I think that's part of the, the, the challenge now is to put that knowledge back into the mainstream so the people understand who the Moors really were. There's evidence of about 150 Moorish castles that are still there in Spain. And if you go to those castles, they will have a bilingual uh, description where they will tell you this was a Christian castle, but it was originally a Moorish one. And they'll tell you when it was Moorish and then when it became Christian. The churches in Spain were originally mosques. They will tell you the period where they were originally mosques and which period they became churches. The Moors then, when they came into Europe, they had already had elements of ancient African wisdom, which allowed them to advance in ways that the Europeans had never imagined. And so in order to survive in this hostile environment, they had to go underground. The same thing happened with the Europeans, who also were close to the Moors and other Arabs who had pieces of this knowledge. They found that this information allowed them to reinterpret 
uh, the history of the world, the science of the world, and that conflicted with uh, with Christians, uh, specifically the Roman Catholic Church. So they also had to ban those people, and that led to the development of what we now call today secret societies, or more specifically, societies of secrets. And those secrets were the ancient educational knowledge that had been developed in Africa thousands of years earlier. Islam will rise up in the course of history by the sixth century, will cut off Europe from world trade by dominating North Africa and the Middle East. Europe was cut off totally from Asia, India, and Africa in terms of trade and access to wealth. So Europe would plunge into what we call the Dark Ages. But it was an economic depression that led to a complete breakdown of society. When they break out of that, they break out with a vengeance that we will never, ever again be in this situation. That breakout comes in the 1400s with the Portuguese. And they, 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 they will wreak vengeance on the rest of the world to control trade routes, economic territories. Where is the wheat grown? Where is the gold? Where is the barley? We will get control of these things because we will never be caught in the dark ages again.